Well, good morning, students at Spring Lake Village. This is Nick speaking. It is Friday, the 14th of August. Hopefully you were uh, with me uh, last Friday when we began our uh, new lecture series uh, entitled, The Raj uh, Company Ruled India in the Land of the Mughals. So this is week two. Um, I mentioned last week um, this word Raj. It comes from the Sanskrit, the uh, ancient language of the Hindus. It literally means the rule, and uh, historians um, normally apply it to the period between 1858, when the British crown assumed control of India from the East India Company, up until India gained her independence in uh, 1947. But a number of historians um, will use the Raj to refer to the long period of British suzerainty over the subcontinent beginning in the early 17th century with the arrival of the British. And that's how I'll apply it to this um, series of lectures. So before we begin, um, with the second part of this new lecture series. I just wanted to bring up the um, issue of audio. Um, I know there's been some technical issues. Um, a number of you sent feedback to Liz and then she got back to me. And I know sometimes it does sound like my uh, voice um, is in some kind of a wind tunnel or at a distance. In any case, um, I think I've finally solved the problem with my Mac. And hopefully going forward, this will um, no longer uh, be an issue. So let's then begin um, with uh, part two uh, of the Raj, uh, building the Raj, uh, British expansion across. So as we saw, you know, in the very early 17th century, the Indian subcontinent, uh, known as the East Indies, was home to exotic spices like uh, cinnamon and other you know, peppers. Um, actually, cinnamon was more in Indonesia, but other rare spices, magnificent fabrics, um, silks, and the amazing cottons that made India so famous, like the madras and calicos and chintzes, luxury goods prized by wealthy Europeans. So India really was seen as this amazing exotic land, seemingly um, endless potential in the area of uh, commercial trade and all the profits that could be realized. Um, this is why the Catholic countries of, the, of Spain and Portugal uh, made their way to India in order to establish um, trading colonies. Um, but Britain wanted in as well. And when it sees the ships of the defeated Spanish Armada in 1588, it paved the way for the monarchy to become a serious naval power. So enter the East India Company. And this was a company established in 1600 that would go on to become the most powerful multinational corporation the world had ever seen, stretching across the globe from Cape Horn to China. So the East India Company would be established with a royal charter by Queen Elizabeth I, granting it a monopoly over business um, with Asia. So we have to imagine a company at this time with the influence and overreach of Google, Amazon, can't believe Amazon's stock is over $3,000 a share, but imagine the East India Company with enormous power granted a state-sanctioned monopoly and even 
granted the right to levy taxes um, abroad. So the East India Company then was the ultimate model and prototype for many of today's um, joint stock corporations. And the idea of a joint stock corporation really was one of the most brilliant and revolutionary innovations of Tudor England. So um, British emissaries tried to make their way to the courts of the Mughals. And in 1612, they were successful for the first time obtaining a firman, which was a royal privilege, a special concession, often a trade concession that was granted. Um, if you've watched, uh, you know, Beecham House, you see how the, the Nawab get, grants uh, Thomas Beecham special trading concessions. I mean, this was a firman. So the first one was granted to the East India Company um, in 1612. And so you see here, um, Surat established in 1612. So where you see the red crosses, those are East India Company um, outposts. And Surat was established uh, in 1612. Later, the embassy of Thomas Rowe in 1615 would be granted other concessions at the Mughal court, which eventually opened the door to other outposts like um, Hugai here in Bengal, Northern Bengal in um, 1658, and the all important uh, trading posts of Calcutta, the most important trading posts in this region. Um, established near the end of the uh, 17th century. And there were others, of course, uh, Madras in 1639 on the southern eastern coast of India. And um, there were others as well, uh, Bombay, of course, um, in uh, 1638. The Portuguese, of course, had the famous trading post of Goa um, that was in the hands of the Portuguese all the way up until about 1961. Um, and the Dutch and later the French too would um, establish um, trading posts. The uh, East India Company's influence would go even further. Um, it would own ports in Singapore and Penang and play a major role in developing cities on the uh, subcontinent. So again, uh, Bombay, India, formerly uh, Bombay, again established by the uh, British in uh, 1638. Um, of course, uh, Calcutta would also become uh, an important uh, outpost as well um, in the south, uh, as well as Chennai Madras. Um, as mentioned earlier in 1639. And uh, the East India Company was one of the largest employers in Britain, and it would eventually hire vast numbers of overseas employees called sepoys. I'll mention them again in a minute, um, who not only um, would become part of the bureaucracy um, in uh, in the subcontinent on behalf of the East India Company, but also would be trained as part of a military um, in the uh, 18th century. Eventually, it would be well over a quarter of a million of these sepoys serving as um, military functionaries. So at the same time that Elizabeth I was um, signing the East India Company into existence in uh, 1600, um, her contingent in India, the Mughal emperor, I should say, actually her counterpart, Akbar, known as Akbar the Great, was ruling over an empire of well over 
750,000 square miles stretching from northern Afghanistan in the northwest to central India's Deccan Plateau in the south and in the northeast, the uh, famous uh, Assamese uh, highlands. It was truly one of the greatest Islamic empires at the time. As I mentioned, um, the other was the Safavid Empire of Persia, and of course the Ottoman Empire farther to the west with its um, sublime port um, in uh, Istanbul. But uh, at the time, uh, the Mughals um, held sway on uh, the Indian uh, subcontinent, and uh, under uh, Jahangir, uh, the Mughals enjoyed a great flowering of art and culture. He was a great patron of the arts. Um, he enjoyed all things Persian. This was the period of the great Persian uh, miniatures. So it was a time of political stability still during the early um, years of his reign, uh, which began around uh, 1605. There was um, brisk uh, economic activity. He took on that name Jahangir. Jahan is Persian for um, the beautiful one. But um, then when he awarded the Furman to the British in 1612 so they could establish their first outpost in Surat, that began to set into motion the eventual decline of the Mughal Empire. Now, his son, um, Shah Jahan would assume the throne um, in 1628. And this period, 30 year period, represented the last great flowering of Mughal culture in art. Um, Shah Jahan was known for decadence and splendor, but already internally you begin to see um, corruption indicate somewhat akin to what was happening in the uh, Ottoman Empire as well. There's uh, similarities there as well. Of course, um, Shah Jahan is most famous for what is acknowledged as the greatest work of Mughal architecture, and that, of course, was the Taj Mahal, begun in 1631, when the beloved wife of Shah Jahan passed away, Mumtaz Mahal, um, who gave her name to the Taj Mahal, which was completed in 1648. It symboli symbolizes, of course, um, the greatest flowering of Mughal architecture, but at the same time, it's symbolic of the excessive financial expenditures at a time when new uh, Mughal uh, resources were um, really shrinking. And then in uh, 1707, the third son of Shah Jahan assumed the throne. He dispatched his older brothers as well as other extended relatives. One of the problems with the uh, Mughals is they didn't have kind of primogeniture and this um, stable line of uh, succession. So Aurangzeb, this Machiavellian, ruthless, brutal son, emerges triumphant. He is regarded in the annals of uh, Mughal history is the last of the great uh, Mughals. Um, unfortunately, um, whereas his predecessors had uh, shown uh, great appreciation for the Hindus and uh, other religions, you know, uh, India, the subcontinent, had so many different uh, religions and sects, but he once again establishes Islam as the one 
true religion, and for him, it was Orthodox uh, Islam. Uh, and he went as, uh, about to ban uh, Hindu ritual and rites and services. He closed uh, a number of the uh, very um, famous um, Hindu temples um, as well. So there's a lot of discussion about um, his brutality uh, and the way he um, treated the uh, Hindus. At the same time, now, as the empire is beginning to um, wane and it's losing control of its frontiers, not enough money um, to pay troops and auxiliary troops. And so this um, carefully crafted system of alliances with local princes and principalities is beginning to fray. In comes other powerful forces, in particular um, the Pashtuns um, in the Northwest, um, the famous uh, Afghan warriors from the Hindu Kush region begin a three-year revolt in um, 1672. In the wake of that revolt, um, the Mughals lost a lot of their suzerainty over this region, and this begins you know, a serious weakening of the uh, uh, Mughal Empire. So with the death of uh, Aurangzeb, who was successful in still kind of maintaining some stability within the Mughal Empire, now without a designated successor, you have the so-called War of Succession in which uh, many of his heirs um, begin to vie for control. And this is the period of the puppet Mughal rulers who become pawns of the British and other rival powers. So a lot of these petty chieftains now are taking advantage of the Mughal empire in decline. And the British are encouraging revolt. Um, they're establishing uh, relationships uh, during this period of instability, inciting sectarian violence and uh, peasant uh, revolts in order to maintain a firm grip um, on their trading posts and, all, and also to expand their commercial interests. And they do this by entering into various alliances with local leaders like the famous Nawabs of Bengal. So again, all this is happening, you know, again, the arrival of more powerful neighbors to the Northwest, Persians, Afghans begin to penetrate into the subcontinent. Perhaps um, the um, greatest attack took place in 1739 at the hands of this very powerful Persian warlord by the name of Nadir Shah. He plundered, attacked the great city of Delhi in 1739. And now this um, confined the Mughal rulers to this last great um, outpost. Um, during the invasion, the Persians um, sacked the royal coffers, uh, looted uh, the treasury, and took with them some of the greatest treasures of the Mughals, including the famous um, peacock throne. And that peacock throne was um, brought uh, back to uh, Tabriz, and then it eventually became the symbol of the famous um, Persian shahs. It's lost. Um, we don't know what happened to it, but we do have images of its resplendent resplendence. It was very ornate. I'll show you a picture in just a minute from a Persian miniature. Also plundered were some of the greatest jewels of the Mughals, including the famous Mountain of Light, um, the Kohinoor, as well as the Sea of Light, um, the Darya. Uh, the famous Darya e 
ignore. So here an image of what the peacock throne may have looked like. We see it in a number of Persian miniatures. So it has this canopy. Um, you see the Shah sitting on a divan, which serves as the throne, but we know it was highly ornate. There are preserved some descriptions of how it was encrusted with uh, fabulous jewels and sheathed in copper and gold and bronze. And then to the right, um, the very famous Kohinoor, the Mountain of Light. Well, that as well as other Mughal jewels by way of the East India Company eventually were purchased by the British royal family and some many of the greatest jewels, as I'm sure many of you are well aware, are part of the crown jewels. So the famous Mountain of Light um, was placed in this crown the favorite crown of the uh, queen mother, um, the mother, of course, of the present monarch uh, Elizabeth II. So the um, East India Company now was very firmly established. Many of the uh, company officials were totally immersed in all things Indian. They loved the food. They loved the trappings of the Mughal emperors. They loved their fabrics. They loved their clothing. They loved their protocol. They even learned the Persian language, again, the official court language of the uh, Mughals. They intermarried. Many of them brought back um, Indian wives. Again, we see how uh, Thomas Beecham, again, that's a fictional story, but he marries a beautiful Indian uh, princess and they produce um, a son through this intermarriage. Um, the Indian officials also liked many of the intoxicants, uh, in particular hashish, but it especially opium, which originally was a, a luxury item at the court of the Mughals, but eventually as it was widely farmed and produced. It was readily um, available to merchants, uh, the middle class, and uh, even uh, farmers um, as well. And um, we find um, the uh, British um, enjoying the smoking of opium. Here we see a British official, the East India Company, uh, smoking um, opium. So as I mentioned, um, knowledge of all things Indian, Indian, their custom, how they interacted, how they interface with the locals, with the chieftains. Um, the British really now had the upper hand as they had established um, these relationships. I mentioned how the East India Company employed local Indians, the famous Sepoys, who were European trained to serve in the administration of the East India Company, but they're mostly famed, especially in the 18th century, when they served as uh, soldiers, as well as officers at times um, in, the, uh, in the British Army. Now, bribery uh, was often used to create alliances with a lot of the nawabs and other local rulers. And um, they pitted, uh, the British did, um, rule, one ruler off another. Um, so they were really taking advantage of the instability and the political situation of the time. Again, that gave them a real um, upper hand as um, the influence of the British East India Company spread. So yes, um, we find in the first quarter of the uh, 18th century, the early 1700s, um, the, the company really is very much involved in the political intrigues and situation, uh, especially after Aurangzeb died in 1707. All these sort of little puppet Mughal rulers now are very much um, manipulated by the very powerful uh, EIC officials, um, et cetera, 
again, as they're playing off these various rulers, bribing them, etc. So many of the Mughal rulers then continued, including the Mughal emperors. Um, in 1717, uh, Farak Siyar would grant the East India Company, again, a firman, allowing them to build nearly uh, 40 villages near the all-important outpost of uh, Calcutta in the Bengal. Uh, and um, this acknowledged um, importance and the continuity of all important international trade um, in the Bengal economy. So just like the Dutch and the French eventually would do, the British would bring silver bullion and copper to pay for transactions that in turn helped the smooth functioning of the Mughal revenue system and increase the benefit to local artisans and traders. So it was a win-win situation for the Mughals um, having uh, depleted so many of their resources. And in, of course, it very much um, increased the revenues of the um, East uh, India Company as well. So, and so too, um, local India rulers sought in their interests to enter into relationships with the uh, East India Company. So we find the Nawabs, these were kind of viceroys or provincial governors of the subcontinent. So the famous Nawabs of Bengal and uh, Awad in the East and in the Deccan, they were allowed to sort of have de facto independence by entering into these lucrative trade deals with the uh, British um, East India Company. So the um, age old rivals of the British would appear on the scene and um, we find them increasingly dabbling in Indian politics as well. The French. The French were um, relative latecomers, uh, as I mentioned, um, to the subcontinent, the last great European power who wanted a piece of the action. The French um, had shown interest um, in this part of the world from the very early years of the 16th century, but a lot of their efforts had been sort of checkmated by um, the uh, Portuguese. The first viable French company was the famous uh, Compagnie, uh, the French East India Company, which was launched by the Minister of Finance, uh, Jean-Baptiste Colbert, um, with the support of his uh, monarch, uh, Louis XIV, um, in 1664. Um, after some false starts, the uh, French company acquired a uh, Pondicherry, its most famous outpost, which was um, located about 85 miles south of uh, Madras. It also would eventually obtain Chandanagar um, in the uh, northeast, uh, Surat in 1666, so it was an outpost alongside the British trading post, which had been established in 1612, 1613. The French colony, of course, of Mauritius and then uh, Mahé uh, in the south. But over time, a lot of the um, factories would be lost um, at the uh, hand, hands of the British. Remember, the British had been there um, for um, some time. So eventually, there was a treaty negotiated between the British and the French, and the French would continue to seek ways to expand their presence in India. Hence, they increased their business activities in Bengal, which um, allowed them to um, get uh, closer to the famous uh, 
Nawab of Bengal, but since the French were not too confident of defeating the British by themselves, they encouraged the Nawab of Bengal, Siraj Ud Daula, to fight the British in order to capture the all important Fort William in uh, Calcutta. Uh, this is a map of uh, India. So the hot pink um, are French possessions um, established in the 18th century. So I didn't mention Yana On, well, you can see that there way up um, in the uh, Northeast there, not kind of midway. And then of course, Pondicherry in the South, uh, Mahé on the West, Western coast. And look at French um, suzerainty in the green. So, in the first half of the 18th century, we find the British and the French really duking it out. Um, India really, in many ways, was a stage, kind of a sideshow for the other great battles that were taking place between these two most powerful uh, European countries. So, of course, we have the um, Seven Years' War, and later in the 18th century, you know, the French and Indian Wars and other famous skirmishes. But on the subcontinent, um, each side was trying to forge these alliances with um, the various local rulers who were in turn trying to carve up a stake in the wake of the fragmenting uh, Mughal Empire, which still existed what but was really breaking up at this time um and the french uh would establish relationships with the famous nawab of Aurangabad and the nizam el muk of hyderabad the famous uh princes of south central india and uh, the British, um, meantime, had established uh, an alliance with the Nawabs of Bengal in Bihar. And that was a coup uh, because um, it allowed the British East India Company the power to collect very valuable um, land taxes, they could um, build an army in Bengal, mint uh, rupees, um, etc. And the British, again, because they had gone Indian, um, really knew the customs, traditions, had for decades been in India, established these alliances, really had the upper hand. But eventually, the French um, would have in one. Jean Francois Duplex, a very able, wily, Machiavellian commander who would restore the prestige of the French um, through his charm and cunning and ruthlessness. He would forge very important alliances and uh, achieve important victories over the British. So next week we'll explore that and how the British East India Company went from strictly sort of an economic interest to a very cunning, all-powerful, and imperialistic uh, enterprise. So that's for next week. Hope you uh, are all well and look forward to talking to you uh, next week.